Well, our panel today is on well-being. And I just realized that well-being is such an exciting and complex uh, human possibility that not just a few people are interested, all of us are interested, irrespective of our age, irrespective of our occupation, irrespective of where we come from. So fundamentally, this panel wants to question or raise issues among all of us that uh, one is, how do we define well-being? And uh, I think uh, Emily's wonderful presentation also brought in a lot of other issues about the source of happiness and uh, whether it's conditional or unconditional. So how do we define well-being? Because I guess we are also bombarded by ideas such as happiness, pleasure, well-being, contentment, satisfaction, right? We have several words, but uh, can, we, can we perhaps have a discussion on the basic need of uh, human living, and if that is contentment, how do we connect it with our day-to-day -day, uh, existence? I also thought if we can connect it in some way to the transformation it can, contentment can bring to our consciousness, that also would be interesting. So perhaps I think uh, we have, how much time maybe I should? Uh, one hour. One, uh, one hour? Total one hour. Total one hour we have. So uh, perhaps if we can do a task, I mean, if all the other panelists agree with me, since we have heard the words well-being, contentment, happiness, pleasure, satisfaction, perhaps we can go around the table to pick your favorite word and you say what it means to you, right? If that's okay? Okay, I think you know, contentment is a very important one. And because you, if you're always in a desire something, and there's no... So if you always desire something, and then you, it brings attachment, and there's no limit, limit how it, the desire can extend. So, so then, in that way, so our mind actually become the boss of, boss of our, you know. So far, actually, we have been a, as a servant of our mind. And we need to actually, basically, we need to actually control it. And uh, control it and uh, uh, be a boss of your mind. And so far, you know, we haven't been actually uh, doing everything, you know, based on what our mind tells us. And we need to contain it, and contempt it, you know. Because you know, there. Are, if you if, if you if you do not be able to contend it, then you want something more and more, and then you just go after that, and then you, in that way you create more problems. So I go for that the contentment. Maybe I won't talk directly about any of those words. <laughs> um, perhaps um, uh, it may make sense. I think you mentioned about that we need to control our mind, and sometimes I find it helpful uh, to think of mind not as an information processing device, which some of us always do, but in terms of mind itself as a control system that we need to understand. And I think I find it very helpful to think of going back to, for some of you are familiar with science, uh, Norbert Wiener's notions of cybernetics and the notion of uh, we as a system and if we think of mind as a control system, uh, definitely a very complex, uh, I think of it as a nested hierarchical control system, then it's probably easier to think in terms of notions like containment. So even if you think of a simple uh, feedback control system like a thermostat, there are two things that are very critical. There is an internal sitting, that the kind of thing that you want, the goal, desire, whatever you may want to call it. Then you perform certain actions to achieve it. Then if there is no match, if there is an error, and that error is very critical. So one of the important things is that in a feedback control system, the feedback control system tries to minimize the error. So one way of thinking about it, if you can predict and if you can keep your expectations down, if you can achieve those expectations, your error will be very low 
presumably it's a simple way to think about maybe that is what will lead to containment. It's not really what you expect, it's really achieving those expectations and as long as you can keep the error zero in some sense, then maybe that is what will get us close to contentment or happiness. I don't know, that's probably one simple way to think about it. I will just put it out in the open and for people to comment on. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, rich way of thinking about it that was also very tangible and palpable. Um, so obviously everyone expects that I'm going to say happiness is the word that I like, but really um, we chose happiness because it's a word that is very universal in its appeal. Um, I know that not everyone understands happiness as, as having the same meaning, but I think there is an intuitive sense that people want happiness and, and, and everybody agrees on that. Um, subjective well-being is uh, a psychological term that is used as a, as a proxy for happiness and there are various uh, sort of questionnaires and scales that will um, measure someone's subjective well-being and, and that again it's, a, it's supposed to be an index of happiness. Um, but there are also happiness scales. Um, I think happiness defined very closely in the way that, uh, that Geshe-la defined contentment is, 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 is the way I would think about it also. I think, I think we just have to think about happiness according to the real causes and conditions of happiness and not according to some other beliefs or ideas that we have that, that are actually harmful. Well-being is such a word that it does not have any synonym. World Health Organization, WHO, defined health as physical, mental, social well-being. Physical, mental, social well-being and not merely absence of disease. This is the definition of health adopted by World Health Organization. The so well-being me means that being healthy, it does not have any synonym. So well-being, <laughs> I am, uh, well-being means being healthy. Now, physically healthy means your organs are in harmony, systems are in harmony. Mental well-being means your mind functions, components of minds are in harmony. Since morning we have been talking of harmony and um, physical, mental, social. The others also has self, others also has mind, others also have physical body. So these are in harmony. Then this is social health. And then WHO has also added another dimension on the insistence of Indian scientists that is spiritual well-being. That is also included, uh, but in bracket. It is a physical, mental, social, and in bracket, spiritual well-being is health and not merely absence of disease. Then, nangi dirchit tam ta dinger koin ba the shi yer tam na yer chen li so na yer chen tein jira chibu chada yore sam. Tinra in tam. Nunga Sarik by Najuko, the mind be signatilines go, Jimjik, uh, she jetta kerchum boratangas. Sarik be muni, Tandaina, Nip Marungi Kualentaina, Koron Zikin Chigamudin Chigokas, Tangayos, Kainzina, Ju Yana Ronsi Trapon, Yana Ju Lapit, uh, Trapon on Dira Yupachila, Muzan of Nungo Tangas. Tinda 
from my point of view, when we talk about uh, happiness, um, harmony, uh, and well-being, um, I think that is, uh, it is important to uh, um, talk about or look at the relation between subject and the object. And when we talk about subject, and um, we need to think about what it is. And first, it is important to recognize what subject is. Is it a physical phenomena? Is it a non-physical phenomena? If it is a non-physical phenomena, how it can be disturbed or influenced by, influenced by physical phenomena? And when I listen to my neuroscience teachers, from the scientific perspective, perspective they talk about uh, brain and neurons and the neurotransmitters. And from their way of explanation, it seems that uh, subject is also trying to uh, explain it by physical means. So I think that we still need to kind of discuss and talk more about subject object relative relations and relations and what it, what it is, you know, what what is subject and what is subjectivity? Gege Islam Sushin, the Suzu Rajon, Jajon Mando Tony, and it did that on the Zukola, Monsin Jadan, and Tishi Jadan Mando, Mobuchi, Levan, and Shinki, Narondoji, and Nambagi, Karsevulta, Rajon Chegi, the Tawaji in Bichani, did Detagi, Zodo, the Mazupena, Revaruji, Kushu, the Savinji Tani. Delay so I think when we talk about uh, happiness and well-being, uh, since we are came from different cultural and social backgrounds, we may have we may seem to have uh, different ways of uh, describing and different definitions for uh, these terms like well-being and happiness. So as a Buddhist monk. Uh, uh, who is trained in Buddhist philosophical uh, traditions. Uh, from my point of view, it doesn't matter whether it is um, happiness or well-being or any kind of like um, mental or physical uh, uh, phenomena, uh, we have to recognize what is the cause to have this kind of uh, mental states or um, whatever it is. And if you recognize what is the cause, then uh, we can tell what it is. For example, like for every phenomena, it has a definite kind of a, a substantial cause. Uh, and uh, one type of, one particular kind of substantial cause will lead to uh, a, a similar uh, substantial, res uh, a similar result. And so if you know this relation um, ships, um, uh, well enough, then we can have a better understanding of these things. Ta tanda di data yuba number sheba le ngadu juji di thola tanga rando vi samju sheba na data le di tanda ngadu di number sheba la na mendo same la na mendo yi la na mendo ah thela chig le chig de thela ma de rang de ngi tene chagor chang do thela ma de be ngadu same ba ye number sheba la ma de ma de be ngi ngadu tene dewa che da data che. Uh, <laughs> I think that when we talk about well-being and consciousness and existence, for my point of view, um, 
it is consciousness is the most important uh, thing and uh, uh, well-being is dependent on consciousness um, the, uh, whether uh, you going to have uh, um, uh, physical or mental well-being uh, or not is very much dependent on what is your mental state and so it comes from a peaceful mind yeah. <coughs> ตมิจุนชัยยินสอ่าตัดติกิสันเดอันเนทามะบะเจเรนสันตัมเจลติกิโกเรสอันติกิเกตาออยุงซะโจดะวะติอันเนลือตางาตายีสุงกุทอนต
the first time you asked it, you said, can a person who is happy or contented or peaceful be, feel jealous, angry, or lonely? And then the second time you said, can a truly happy person uh, feel jealous or out of control, angry, or lonely? And those are really different because the average person who I think has a, a good level of happiness, I would say yes, absolutely they can feel angry, they can feel jealous, and they can feel lonely. And, they, and, and their anger might motivate them to act on behalf of an injustice. That's very important. If something unfair happens in the world, it is okay to be angry and to use that to fuel a behavior to reconcile something that's unfair or unjust. Earlier, one of the Geshe's talked about, and this is an extreme case, talked about someone in a position of knowing that one person is going to harm thousands of people and taking it upon themselves to kill that person. So I don't know if I have a strong opinion about that, but it does suggest that even the very happy, the, the exceptionally contented and peaceful person can get aggressive when it's necessary. So I think they still can. Will they spontaneously feel it as frequently as people who are not happy? I do not believe so. Will they get carried away? Uh, as you said, will they get out of control? I don't think so. I don't think that's likely. So the question when you ask, can contented person you know, get jealous? So when you talk about the containment, I think you know, the containment has a, you know, a certain degree. And and to have a really, you know, uh, full containment. And uh, I think uh, that person has to have some sort of, you know, uh, ability to control their mind. So once that person has uh, some sort of ability to control their mind, they may get the angry, they may get jealousy, all negative emotion, but less than other people who are not very much contented. So these, you know, the mental Controlment is very much, you know, affect each other, influence each other, very much related to. A truly happy person, as ma'am said, or a content person, very difficult to <clears throat> get him jealous of anything. And that part, I think, to my uh, level, that I, if I am contained, I will not be jealous of anything. That part is all right. But to become angry, whether he gets angry or not, yes, I agree. If my contentment is disturbed, I'll get angry. And for a greater cause, as you said, the society's contentment is disturbed, I'll get angry and I'll take weapons against them. Krishna did it. Lord Krishna did it. So, even a content person who has controlled mind, everything he has controlled, for retaining its own contentment, he may get angry, and for a greater cause of the society, he may get angry. Now, third question, <clears throat> whether he ever feels lonely? Of course. <laughs> of course, he will uh, often feels lonely, and that is why all, all creations are there. A content person create, wants to create another a, a breed of content persons. So that I know I am not alone, I am not lonely. God created the whole universe because of this only. He is a contained person. But he created all these things because I was one but I want to become multiple. So loneliness he fails and out of this loneliness the whole world is created, whole sect is created. Well again I think what we have raised are very important um, um, issues, uh, uh, well, of course, the truly is uh, a kind of a addition which I bought, but uh, I don't think when we talk about contentment or happiness in this real sense, it doesn't mean it's comparative or superlative. There's only one, one contentment, which is not based on degrees. So such a person, I think I completely perhaps agree with Dr. Mukhopadhyay that a truly contented person perhaps can become angry, but may not be jealous. Because jealousy is wanting, uh, you know, not being satisfied with what you are, have and uh, not very satisfied with what other person has. So basically that. Uh, but uh, friends, I think these are 
very serious questions, and these are existential issues. And I think it's very important that uh, at the same time we are struggling with philosophical issues, scientific issues. I think it's very important to bring in this day-to-day -day life situations in front of us and analyze them openly without, um, without many blinkers, you know. So, so that's one way of looking at it. Uh, well, I want to bring in another question which uh, was passed on to me earlier is that other than meditation, uh, is there another way to treat a depressed mind because mostly health is unbalanced or uh, depression comes from unhappiness due to too much consumerism, too many things, too many material things. So other than meditation, is there a way to treat a depressed mind? Uh, I don't know whether if any, one, one response to that is, uh, yeah, I think you wanted to say, yeah, please. Depression is a disease of self, when self gets disconnected with the environment. Meditation is one of the ways to manage these depressed patients. You ask the depression uh, patient to do gardening, you ask the depression patient to uh, do something where he can connect. You just have a uh, conversation with him and find out to what activities he can connect himself. This disconnect is the cause of this depression. Now, if you can dig out from his mind that what with what he can connect himself, this will be the way out of this disconnection. So meditation is only one way. There may be many other ways. I gave one example is the gardening. Many times, the, many times you connect with the pet. Many times you connect with the plants. Many times you connect with different types of environment. Different types of people. So you may get depressed in a, with some people. But immediately the cohort is changed and you, you immediately get connected with those people. Maybe a little philosophically, I think it's also important... Uh, to, to bring um, the point which Rinpoche brought, which is to understand the subject-object divide better, because um, meditation is basically trying to understand, trying to observe what's happening, right, in your inner space. So even in depression, if we can be awareful, observe what's happening inside us, that's, I think, it's a nice beginning. So to distinguish between, you know, uh, or to ask questions, are we, what is that, what, what is that which is in you which is depressed? Or try to understand the cause of it. So those are some ways. Um, but I think, as again, Dr. Mukhopadhyay said, uh, since I'm also interested in farming and gardening, gardening is an excellent way of being happy. I have a little bit reservation being a doctor with this meditations. You see, a surgeon who has been operating for eight hours on a patient, is he not meditating? A simple phlebotomist who draws blood from the patient in just a technician level or an attendant level, he has been drawing blood of 100% just continuously one after. Is he not meditating on that? What do you mean by meditation? Meditation on what? He said, we use this word meditation in a very uh, uh, diffuse way or <laughs> gross way without any definition. Particularly being a doctor, I have seen these uh, uh, doctors are mostly healthy without doing any meditation. Particularly the surgeon, the cardiac surgeon, the neurosurgeon, hours after hours they operate. Is it not meditation? There is a bit of reservation on this definition of meditation. And again, like Sunazwani. Amjigiani, Nepal, 
Yeah, yeah. So his um, his response. Um, so when we talk about meditation, we can talk about uh, analytical meditation and um, uh, uh, single pointed meditation. So, um, for example, if a surgeon is doing uh, uh, surgery for many hours, and if he's very at very attentive towards his work, it is kind of a meditation. So, and uh, when we talk about um, analytic med analytical meditation, uh, the when the People who are even debating with one particular topic, say the impermanence nature of a uh, uh, port. And then at that time we say that he is analytically meditating on the nature of impermanence of the port. So literally meditating is nothing but paying focused attention to one particular object or the topic. Uh, I think the panel theme which we have selected for this evening is uh, not very simple because all the words which we have used, the key words, well-being, existence and consciousness, has a lot to with, do with what we are currently discussing. So uh, just to bring that back to your focus. And I think there's one more question which is slightly provocative on meditation and I think for that reason we should perhaps uh, raise it. Um, well. Uh, well, uh, I, I can put this question in different ways, so perhaps let me try this. Instead of perhaps doing meditation and learning meditation using textbooks, traditional textbooks, how about being more compassionate to animals? This is the question someone has raised. Anyone wants to? Do you want to go to what and the <laughs> Samba <laughs> Tartu <laughs> So I think um, basically what he is saying that um, uh, for that if you take closer observation of the kind of um, situation that uh, these animals in and what kind of surfings they are experiencing and if you reflect upon their conditions and surfings then I think um, you are in a, a better position to help these uh, surfing uh, animals. Earlier, one of the panelists, uh, something Geshe Namgyalji, um, raised about um, what is fundamental to contentment. So, is consciousness? I think one. Of, I think to you, right? Uh, is consciousness fundamental? So, here is a question, saying, what is the basic source of happiness? Is it consciousness? So the basic source of happiness, where do you derive happiness from? Is it from social interactions? Is it a fulfillment? I mean, this, these things I'm extending. The question here is, what is the source of happiness? Is it consciousness? To understand it better, is it emotional fulfillment? Is it uh, social appreciation? Is it accomplishment? Is it uh, being respected by another person? So what exactly is it? Or is it consciousness? And I think as Geshe said, uh, is it consciousness, which is something very fundamental, and if I, pardon me using for this, 
philosophical jargon, which is ontological, which is uh, fundamental to your core being, if we consider that as consciousness. So true happiness perhaps comes from that core being of what you are. Perhaps that's what this person has asked. Anyone want to respond? Uh, I'll give a quick response. I, I think that consciousness is much bigger than happiness because you can be very depressed and be conscious. You can be very angry and be conscious. And maybe my way of thinking about consciousness is, is narrower, but I think of it as, as some degree of, of, of conceptual awareness of, of what's happening inside and outside of yourself. Um, as in, in terms of the, the research on happiness, I still think that it's really arising not from one source or one thing, but from a combination of factors. And that uh, is very much like most other things. They don't come from one thing. They come from multiple different intersecting harmonious factors. And from, from my uh, assessment of the literature, happiness comes from a f an easy, a capacity to experience positive emotions, a willingness to experience negative emotions but recover quickly from them, an inner awareness, whatever you want to call it, mindfulness, meditation, some awareness of one's inner uh, workings, and a strong, connected, uh, safe, interdependent sense of community with others. So I think all of those together are what comprise uh, a happy way of, of, of in, in engaging with the world. Uh, When we talk about happiness and sadness, these are mental states. And uh, when we talk about mental states, then where it came from, uh, when we ask this question where it came from and why we are having this kind of mental uh, states, then we have to talk about the law of causalities. We believe that these mental states that we experience in um, our life are uh, because of other cause and conditions. And when we talk about what are the cause and conditions, then we need to talk about not only this life, we have to talk about the life before this life. And, uh, and then we talk about these actions that we have committed in the, uh, in the previous lives. And then if you say that, uh, what is the cause? Then I would say the positive actions that we have collected so far is the source of happiness that we have. I think uh, one question which brings in what we just heard and what other panelists have shared is, and I think it's important to discuss and think about it, if not in this panel, some other time, or in our private offices, wherever, which is, is happiness a mental state? Is happiness an emotion? I think that conceptual clarity is very important. Is happiness an emotion, like sadness, anchor, etc.? Or is it a fundamental state? I think with that clarity, that clarity would help us to discuss more about um, you know, other issues which we are discussing. But I don't know whether we have time about it. Uh, I personally consider happiness not as an emotion, but something which is much more kind of fundamental. That's why I would like to equate it with contentment and hence unconditional. <laughs> would, what do scientists consider more important? Internal happiness? or external happiness. Narayanan. 
Um, I'm not really sure what the terms internal happiness and external happiness means. Uh, presumably, if happiness is something to do with mind, a person, then obviously that is important. So there is only one happiness as far as I can see. And as a scientist or as a human being, I would say it's important. <laughs> We can talk about uh, happiness um, uh, uh, comes from external uh, uh, things and happiness comes from inner uh, things. And if you compare these together, then I consider inner happiness or the uh, happiness source from your inner states are more important and more valuable. I think uh, the, the, the danger in relying upon external happiness too much is that, that the sources for external happiness can, will be depleting, is in order of depletion day by day, and we may not have any much sources of external happiness. So better be, better be trying to look out for something which is more internal and be happy, irrespective of whatever is available externally. But just to respond to that, I think it puts one question versus the other question, because that clearly means you have to make a subject-object distinction, though, between internal and external. As the other person said, if that distinction has, goes away, then there is no internal or external. Yeah, I think uh, that philosophical divide, and that is why I think this panel theme on well-being is very much connected with existence, you know. Uh, so, w what is the demarcation of subject-object divide? And is that binary stable? I think that question is also important. When we make that binary of subject-object, how far can we go with the subject-object binary? Does it at some stage, we may have to take them as a whole, as organic. I think I should be talking less. Uh, well, uh, we are coming to the end of this panel and uh, uh, I think we tried to bring in many issues, but uh, as we could see from the questions and the panelists' remarks, I think we all agreed that well-being is complex. Definitely it is connected with our daily living and thereby our existence. Any comments from any panel, any panelists? Um, I wanted to bring up one idea that I think relates to this uh, relative importance of internal internally derived happiness versus externally derived happiness. There's a construct that Western psychologists have uh, been studying recently called self-compassion. And, uh, and the reason they have come up with this is because it seems like for some Western people, they seek happiness by getting affirmation from external sources and by always uh, trying to achieve uh, things that will satisfy an external um, uh, demand. And, and in the end, they become very depleted. So they're always helping other people, they're always trying to make other people happy, but they're not attending to their own well-being. And, and so this idea of self-compassion has arisen as, a, as an antidote to that tendency to be trying to find happiness by doing things externally and not doing anything internally. So just another idea to think about. And <laughs> And 
Çek de ye çoğuzu nada de onun rene da nangı de gittin de çoğuz da de ne gümüzü çekiyoruz? When we talk about externally derived happiness and internally derived happiness, we can also think that these externally derived happiness are kind of temporary and internally derived happiness are kind of everlasting. And when we talk about the Buddha, um, we call him omnipresent, uh, omniscient. And um, uh, so he, he has perfected the uh, cultivation of happiness with internally derived kind of uh, internally derived happiness.